One of my Careblazers told me that she went to her doctor and was like, what can I do? I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm dealing with a lot of these challenges and symptoms. And the doctor literally told her, it's not a responsibility to help you or teach you how to help your person with dementia. That is what she was told. I knew I wanted to do something, but like most people, you're scared. One day I was leaving a patient's home and I was driving back to the VA clinic and I totally got T-boned. Horrible accident, total both cars. The other car was oh taken gosh. by ambulance. And it was my wake up call that like, what am I gonna do? Keep complaining about this thing or am I gonna do something about it? What am I doing? I can help five people a day at the hospital or I can help literally, if I want to, millions, five million millions. people a day. Yeah. <laughs>Hey guys, my name is Chris Channa, and today you are on the Carepreneur Show where we mix entrepreneurship and healthcare all in one. And we have a very special guest, Dr. Natalie Edmonds, who is board certified in geropsychology. She has worked for the VA Medical Center for nearly 10 years as a geropsychologist. And approximately five years ago, Dr. Natalie founded Dementia Care Blazers, and she is the lead Care Blazer. Dementia Care Blazers is a community that helps. Family caregivers cope with the challenges of caring for a loved one with dementia. And a careblazer is a person who loves and cares for someone with dementia, also known as a dementia care hero. As part of the community, Dr. Natalie shares dementia tips, strategies, and information for family members caring for a loved one with any type of dementia, such as Alzheimer's disease, Lewy body dementia, vascular dementia, and much more. Every Sunday, she shares a new video to help caregivers in their dementia caregiving journey. And Dr. Natalie is actually the number one dementia channel on YouTube with just over 100,000 subscribers and 7.69 million views. Just the sheer impact that she's had on the dementia care community is amazing. And she can also be found on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok with videos well over you know, three and five million views each. She has done and incredible things for those that are caring for a loved one. And Dr. Natalie, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I'm I'm a raving fan, and you know, and I, I feel like one of the things I'm most curious about is like, you know, like well, how did we get to the care blazing journey? And I'm excited to like dive into that more. But obviously, it started, you know, much earlier on, um, and it sounds kind of like in the VA medical space. And you know, I'm I'm curious, like, you know, what. Like, when did you become interested in, ger I guess, geropsychology? And if, if I'm pronouncing it wrong, I apologize. Um, and then, you know, how did that come about? Like, what, what intrigued you about that particular, like, area of focus in college or, or wherever you found that? Yeah. So, actually, it's – people are so shocked to hear it. But, you know, I, I got my doctorate degree in clinical psychology. So, there's, like, lots of years of training. And to become a psychologist, like you go to graduate school, you have internships, practicums, right, like fellowships, all of these things. And working with older adults and learning about older adults is like hardly any of it. I hope this changes in the future. But what a lot of people don't realize is whatever fancy initials are behind somebody's name, like that just tells you they've got the, the basic training. You know, like if you think about a human being and everything that you would need to know to give them great care, it's going to be impossible to actually be a specialist in that area. So when I was going through graduate school, I had like half a day on working with older adults and dementia was not even like a thing that was focused on or talked about. And it was only when you get on the job, like training experiences, I started to notice a group of people that we didn't really give extra attention to or special attention to. We were treating them like everybody else. And I was noticing it seemed like we were missing the mark. Like for instance, my uh, one of the areas when I was first starting getting my training, I wasn't a psychologist yet, yet, but I was getting my training experience. I worked in a forensic hospital where there were people considered in Arizona guilty except insane. And we do support groups a lot. And there was one person in there who was much older than all the rest. And it always seemed like he just wasn't really invested, wasn't really getting it, wasn't really like almost people kind of like stayed away from him, didn't really engage with him. And like, well, he couldn't barely even hear what we were saying, like where he was positioned in the group. And so it made me start thinking like, what are all the other ways we aren't meeting this need? And so it kind of planted a seed. And then after an internship, you have to go and get, well, you don't have to, but 
you probably should go get a fellowship depending on your area. So I decided to take a fellowship with a heavy focus on geriatrics, gero psychology, because I was like, I don't know if we're actually helping this group like we should be. And that like, just and changed how my many whole people, life. How many people were in that class? Like, was it just like, was it you and like the professor or like, was it actually a pretty, like, cause I feel like, like you said to your point is like, this is like, and I've always felt this way too. I'm like, I, I never once came across this industry in college and, and no one ever talked about it. Like, and I feel like most people I talked to, like kind of just stumbled into some sort of like yes. senior care world, but exactly. not because it was like a focus or not because people were trying to attract talent to it or, you know, attract people that had a, a, an interest in it, you know? Correct. Like I wouldn't have even really realized that this was an area for me to focus on or an area of people who truly needed help. If I wasn't realizing like, what is it about this person that like everybody, nobody really seems to be wanting to talk to. He doesn't even seem to be noticing what's going on in the group. Like what, you know, and it was something so simple as like, he can't even hear us. Like, has anybody checked his hearing? And it, like, so that was like a big aha. And it made me realize like, wait, I just went through like 12 years of school and <laughs> older adult, challenges and situations and um, diseases that are prevalent in older adult communities like got no attention and i totally uh, understand it like you're, they have to like teach the basics you know but at the same time that means the people who are caring for the older adult community a lot of them don't have specialty training and there's not like a requirement they're, they're getting their training as people are coming through the door and so, right. and, and, yeah. and it's crazy too, is you have, like, like I was reading this article in ARP recently, how you have 53 million, you know, Americans who are unpaid caregivers. And, and out of that, I, I forgot what the percentage was of you know, those taking care of the elderly, but it was, a, I want to say it was about 80% of those 53 million are the ones that are actually taking care of, you know, seniors, you know, whether it's their you know, aging parents or whether it's a spouse. And, and it's like, you know, that's a lot of people that are like, you know, kind of overseeing the care needs of, of a loved one that's in, in a different age bracket that probably has different, you know, needs than yeah. your general population. Yeah. And think about the way the traditional healthcare system is set up. I've worked in, like, I personally think the VA is amazing for older adults and geriatrics. We actually, I got so much training, special emphasis on geriatrics. Uh, I felt like I had some really great mentors, but even in some of the best teams possible, even with all of the training and, you know, going on and getting board certified and all of that, like you're still limited to the healthcare system. You're still limited to, to here's the time length you should be seeing people. Can you see right. more people? Like there's all this yeah. pressure. And it's like to compare me to my colleague who is seeing a 20 year old patient right. to me seeing the 80 year old patient. Well, I've, I'm not going to do it in 30 minutes and I need yeah. more time and I want to see them yeah. more frequently. And I need to be talking to the family as well, instead of just the and patient. Can, and it's totally yeah. different. And when, because this is not something that has been a big area of focus in the past, trying to convince administrators and uh, supervisors above who did not specialize in geriatrics and don't see a lot of people um, in that age bracket, they just don't get it. They're like, well, you just need to see more people. Right. <laughs> I'm like, right. But like, are we actually here to help the people? Are we actually here yeah. to help the person with dementia and help the family members? Or are we just like checking a box and doing another number? And, it, and, it, and it's like, I remember like even in, in kind of my, I, like um, as I was starting to get familiar with this this space, uh, you know, you know, say Mrs. Smith walks through the door, and we're kind of doing uh, you know our uh, initial consult evaluation for our assisted living facility or something. You know, in that first half an hour of meeting Mrs. Smith, I mean, I I might have no idea that there's like an underlying dementia because she could completely fool me. You know, like she's got me laughing, smiling, telling stories, and then I get over here to go talk to the family, and the family is like well, really, that's not all true. Like, like, you know, that didn't actually happen. And this, you know, and, and then all of a sudden I start realizing like, oh, and, and then I realized in that moment how it's such a collaborative effort between, you know, the families and in, in their involvement. Like we, when we would go do this kind of initial evaluation after that time, after I learned that we'd spend a lot of time with the family members to get background information on the progression of things. And then we would also spend time with that, with that individual to kind of get a feel for their personality types and, and things like that. But exactly. You know, I always say, if we actually care about people with dementia, we can't ignore the people giving them that care, which is going to be right. primarily their family members. So yeah. we have to start putting attention on those people, uh, you know, 
to, just to think they should be following all these recommendations and doing all these things, or to think that one appointment or one evaluation and then giving them like a brochure or a handout and telling them to come back in a year, that is not enough. Like, what are they supposed to do during that meantime? Like, that's what really, I think, started fueling my fire was I was yeah. working in a really amazing geriatric team. So great. Like, I think like the best of the best really had great like amazing experience. I think that respected all the healthcare providers in there. I felt like we all had big hearts, but we were diagnosing people with dementia and asking them to come back in a year. And I was like, what are they doing in the meantime? So then I was like, well, I'm going to start, like, I'm going to get permission from the hospital. I want to start a support group. I got permission. They gave me that permission, but guess what happens? The caregiver would have to come to the support group, find out what are they going to do with the person with dementia? How do they get somebody to watch them? Can they show up? Can everybody come at this one time? And then if they can't, it, it was really hard. Like it's a hard ask for them to be able to come and then battle the traffic, you know, try to deal with that supervision. And then even for the people where I'm like, well, I can see them one-on-one -on -one and do therapy with them and help them through the caregiver stress. Well, caregiving has so many unpredictable uh things that happen, so many things that pop up that we don't even realize, or the person got sick or whatever the case may be. So they would call me and they need to reschedule. Well, my next appointment's going to be in three months. And it's like, so you're yeah. going to wait three months to give them the information that they need. I just, I started to get so frustrated with the way that it's set up to help actually, I think can lead to a lot of frustration. Right. Right. And, and a lot of times maybe it leads to maybe misdiagnosis some, sometimes with you know, like, you know, doctor not being able to have the appropriate amount of time to really understand what is going on with that person. And then that could lead to potentially wrong medications. And then all of a sudden, next, you know, this person's got the you know wrong medications, the wrong diagnosis, and then we got to backtrack everything because we, we didn't spend the appropriate time in the beginning. Maybe. You know? Well, there's a lot of education too that needs to happen because like you said, somebody with dementia might go to an appointment and their, their language is still pretty intact and they might know how to make some jokes. They know how to deflect and they seem like they're pretty okay. And the family member starts to mention, well, I'm actually really concerned about how my mom is doing or how my spouse is doing. She's not quite seeming the same. She's forgetting a couple things. And it's so easy in a quick 20 minute appointment for the person to say, oh, it's just fine. It's just normal aging right. without much investigation or um, further follow-up. And so I, I talked to a lot of care blazers who are frustrated with, they didn't think anything was wrong. You know, they just passed it off as normal aging and they actually had to advocate for themselves to go get a formal uh, evaluation, something beyond maybe right. a 30 question MMSC or something. And, and a lot of providers either, you know, time constraints, busyness, not really thinking it's that serious. It's actually really difficult, I think, a lot for the family members to get the information they're looking for and get the help and resources they need. Uh, somebody was, somebody emailed me today and was like, my, um, my doctor basically said, uh, there's nothing we can do and gave me like a handout and, and schedule a follow-up in a year. And I'm like, that's the message a lot of these people are getting. One of my care blazers told me that um, she went to her doctor and was like, what can I do? I'm, I'm really struggling. I'm dealing with a lot of these challenges and symptoms. How do I help with that? And the doctor literally told her, uh, we don't teach you how to raise a kid when you have a baby. We are not, we, it's not our responsibility to help you or teach you how to help your person with dementia. That is what she was told. Ah, now, I, and not every doctor is awful. Obviously right. not. Like, there are really, really yeah. great people out there. But this kind of thing, I feel like what we accept to be the standard of dementia care is, is actually horrible. I right, think we have exactly. to raise the bar on dementia care, on education, on making sure the healthcare providers seeing people with dementia have the training, have the understanding. I think what we consider acceptable is well below what I think should be acceptable. 100%. And, and so when, at what point in time in your journey did you decide to go and kind of like dive deeper specifically uh, as a geropsychologist? Like, was that a was that a, like, a, like, was that like after five years of being in the field and realizing this? And then what kind of support is out there for that particular certification? Okay. So I was working for the VA, like you said, large hospital, yeah. which actually there's lots of great things to say about it. And I just was so, I could feel a sense of just frustration. Like I'm not doing enough. I'm not yeah. helping enough. It's the same questions over and over again. People are having the same struggles over and over again. In a day, I can only see a handful of patients. Literally, there are millions of caregivers out there, thousands, you know, within this hospital system. I can only do so much. And I just started to feel this pull, but I didn't really know what to do. And then at one point in my VA career, I worked in home-based primary care, which I just think is the most fantastic program anybody could ever be a part of. And it's where- yeah. Is uh, that like, 
doctors coming into the and doctors coming into the home, yeah. spending time in the home environment as opposed yes. to them coming into the center. Okay, got exactly. It. So when it became too difficult or challenging for the family member to have the person come to the hospital, we would have the whole primary care team available to go to the home. A nurse, a pharmacist, a social worker, physical therapist, or an occupational therapist, psychologist, um, nurse, PCP. And it was it's such a lovely program, especially for people with dementia. But I could see at max five people a day. You're driving from home to home to home in a big city. Right. And I'm like seeing the same questions, same questions, same questions. Over, And it's like, oh my gosh, what can I do? And I knew I wanted to do something, but like most people, you're scared to do something different. You're scared right. to break the mold. And one day I was leaving a patient's home and I was driving back to the VA clinic in a government vehicle and I totally got T-boned horrible accident, total both cars. The other car was oh taken gosh. by ambulance. I, I don't know. I've never actually like been in an accident like that, but like there's wow. smoke and smells. I could not open the door from the driver's side in. I had to like get out. It was this big thing. And it was my wake up call that like, what am I going to do? Keep complaining about this thing? Or am I going to do something about it? So right. I just decided, okay, well, what could I do? Like, I'm not a business person. Like I've never done anything like businessy before. I didn't even I didn't even know I was starting a business. I truly didn't. I just turned on my phone, which is still what I do. And I just started answering common questions that I got every day in my practice. Every day at the hospital, people were asking me questions, basic questions. You know, what do you do when somebody wants to go home or they won't shower? What's the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? I'm like, maybe there are other people in the world who are looking for this answer and they do not have a team of people driving around to go answer it for them. Maybe like they would like to know. So I just turned on my camera and every week I just answered a question or talked about a common struggle and I just started recording videos. And then surprisingly, somehow people wanted to like, it, there was a need. It became apparent. Yeah. There's definitely a need. And I, I would say it took me a little bit too long to realize, but about two years into doing that, I was like, I think I have, a, I think I have something. <laughs> what else could, you know, like, what can I do with yeah. this? And so that's how like Care Blazers was born. That's, that's so cool. Gosh, that's so cool. So like at this point in time, are you still working? You're still working with the VA, yes. right? And, and, and so, and, and you down, how long was this uh, Gero psych psychology course or like, was that a, was oh, that a, okay. how long was that? So, yeah. Board certification in Gero psychology. It is not just a course. I don't think like okay. a course is going I, to I, I apologize. I, I, no, 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 that's okay. I, nobody okay. knows. I know. Nobody so knows. Just, yeah. And there's like just a handful of people who have it. Basically, there's a whole certification process you have to go through to even okay. be considered. So you have to apply. You have to show them your training in geriatrics, have certain um, – you have to be working in primarily geriatrics for a certain number of years. You have to like document all the training you've received. You have to like do certain essays, like what would you do in certain situations? You have to submit case studies and samples didacted without so, so redacted you, without any, you whatever, you know, personal you details. And then you have to fly at this time. It was in California and you sit in yeah. front of a panel and all like, for a half day, I was grilled by the top geriatric experts in terms of, you know, they grilled me on my work samples. Why did I come to yeah. this diagnosis? Why didn't I do this? They gave me hypothetical wow. scenarios. What would you do in this situation and why? They asked me like basic knowledge people should know. They wanted to know, you know, like certain tests and what would I give and who's the creator of that test? Like just, so it's just like a, now, and this, I have to keep that up. <laughs> at this point, had you... Like was was a lot of the insight coming from the your care blazers and your experiences that they were going through, or was it still more so um, like the the insight you had from the actual field? From just the field. Um, okay, yeah, gotcha. Okay, just so, the field. Like to eat. Yeah, I, I didn't really. I don't. When I became board certified, I don't. Dementia care blazers wasn't like was a little itch in the back of my mind that I was gotcha. too afraid to take action okay. on. Gotcha. And so, I, so then. It, it was yeah, like right after that, that, that's when the T-bone happened. That's when like, you're like, all right, I'm going to start moving forward and actually put more effort, more time into dementia care blazers and, and building that community. Yeah. Like, well, I didn't yeah. even know like dementia care blazers was dementia care blazers. It was just like, yeah. how do I turn on my T yeah, like, yeah. camera and how do I help? And yeah. So it was, I, and I worked at the VA doing this on the side up until last year in November. Wow, that's so cool. All right, so now I'm, I'm now I'm getting into. The, I, I wanted to kind of understand the the gyro psychology thing because I think that it's very interesting for someone that might be interested in that. Um, but I also you have to have a doctorate degree in clinical gotcha. psychology to. Eat, gotcha. Eat. So so that's kind of like the prerequisite to uh, then gyro psychology. Awesome. 
So the the one thing I find very really interesting. So then with the Care Blazer idea, um, you're kind of doing this as a side project now. Do you remember which like your first video was? Like was it a, was it yeah. a YouTube video? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I, my first video was what's the difference between dementia and Alzheimer's disease. I decided to okay. just do it on the question I got the most. Gotcha. And, and is that, was that, was that on YouTube that you posted that or? Yeah. Okay. Cause, cause now, I mean, now you're like TikTok famous and you got all these like amazing reels no. and like. <laughs> YouTube is where it's at. That's where I've always started. Yeah. Everything else I'm experimenting with and TikTok is new. I'm actually really low there. I don't know. I have somebody who's just like taking my YouTube videos and putting on there. I don't understand the TikTok. Well, I think, I, I think your, that. your, your, your style of reels on maybe Instagram, like I love the, the, there's just your fresh approach to it. it it's so creative um, and it's so helpful and so insightful. So I just, I'm just blown away. So you, so you started doing like that first post, was that about five years ago or was that Ooh, a little a over? Question. I could probably look it up. <laughs> yeah. It's probably like, I would say four to five years ago was that first post and, and and then i guess um so you're doing this on the side as you're continuing to you know work for the va mm -hmm. um and 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 like it was was covid a big catalyst uh for care blazers to to grow or was there any like one particular moment that you were like oh my gosh i think we're on to something or well definitely i remember when i made my first thousand dollars <laughs> right? Like not <laughs> through the VA, like through online. And it just yeah. like blew me away. And it wasn't yeah. like, for me, it was more like, cause this is so unusual. It's so strange. It's like, am I even doing like, am, is what I'm doing? Okay. Is this like, I'm a psychologist in a healthcare facility. What am I even doing? Like there's so much like thought drama and questioning I had to do for myself. And yeah. So I just remember that was probably like 2000 and 18 or something when I just thought, okay. well, maybe I'll put together a course. Maybe people want to like learn the basics. And so right. that's what I did. And then once you start taking action, you actually gain more clarity. So it's like, once I took an action, then you realize, oh, here's another step or here's another step. And so I started building this business on the evenings and the weekends. And I started to realize, I think like it was taking off. I'm like, I think this is a business, but to leave what is normal for a psychologist and to leave a big healthcare system and to leave the security of like a great retirement plan. It was super scary. If I had right. to be honest about what my catalyst was, was, well, I had like surpassed my salary at the VA working on the weekends and in the evenings doing YouTube videos. And then I went to an entrepreneur conference, which was like the first big conference <laughs> I ever went through. And I was sitting was there. It? What is it? Which, which, which conference was it? Okay, it was Funnel Hacking Live. Oh, Russell, yeah. Russell Brunson. And it was, <laughs> it was 20, what, it's 2021. It's September. Wow. And I'm like, okay. I think I got to leave my job. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> like, all of these people, I'm like, they, like, these are my people. They're thinking yeah. like me. They're talking about making an impact in the world. They're doing good. Yeah. Nothing was like yeah. sealed, like slimy. They're actually wanting to make positive change, like good hearted people. I'm like, what am I doing? I can help five people a day at the hospital, or I can help literally, if I want to, millions, five million millions. people a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What am I doing? Still hanging on to this hospital. It was just fear. So literally yeah. two months later, I was gone. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's so cool. Cause like, I think when I first came across your, your content or your channel, or even maybe your, your website, I don't, I, I feel like there was only maybe a couple thousand, uh, maybe, maybe like 15,000, 20,000, maybe uh, YouTube, you know, uh, subscribers. And then I, I think last time I recently checked, um, cause somehow like, I was like, I need to reach back out to Natalie, Dr. Natalie and see what you, you know, see what you're up to. Um, and I, and I went on there and I was like, holy cow, I was like a hundred thousand. I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Um, and I think what I was so just, what was so cool is to see just the impact that like you're having on this space that to me really doesn't have a lot of resources. And to think that there's that many people out there that, cause you, and like, you know, like the number of people that are subscribing to your channel versus the number of people watching yeah. is like just a small percentage. Right. So the fact that you have a hundred thousand people in this world that are like subscribed to your channel because they need this information is just like, it just goes to show you how much of an impact you're having. 
You know, it it's blows not- my mind. It's like, there's nothing different really that I'm doing now that I was doing in the hospital, but it feels so much different because now I get people, like I get letters and I get things in yeah. the mail and I get like cards and like people literally, it, I just think, oh, I don't think this. I actually know it's the complete opposite, but I'm thinking, you know, well, people can find, they can get the help. They can get the support. And I'm realizing, no, they can't. No. They don't know yeah. where to go. They don't have the access. They don't have the resources. They're, they don't have access to the people who have the knowledge or the training or the time to right. really share the information. And so I, like, it really opened my eyes. I just think I'm posting a, a really basic, boring video on a topic and doing it consistently over the years, I realized it's, it's actually impacting lives significantly. And that just like blows my mind. Yeah. And, and what's so cool is the thing that like, we're just on the very, very beginning yeah. of what is going to be a massive, yeah. like number of people who are going to need this information. Like just the fact that like, like you're, you've built all of this content out now. And like, just to know that all of those caregivers that come next, are going to finally have a platform that they can go to and actually get this information like yeah. and, and and all these tools and this information all for free like the fact that you know to me like that's so valuable and um i just i, I don't know i'm just i'm such a huge fan you know oh, like, i love it thank you and i think that we we are seeing an increase in people who are wanting now to get into the field and, and right. at least in terms of online, I've noticed, like, I, I don't think like, I think I knew like one person who was maybe in the field when I was like doing it online. And now, yeah. now I'm like, oh, I don't know, maybe if it's because now I'm on Instagram. And so I see them all, but I'm like, I don't, I think this is like a more and more people are starting to come into the field and, in this way. Absolutely. And, and, and champion this message and, um, and help, you know, because I, I think, man, the, the number of people that are like isolated, doing this on their own, they don't have support. Maybe their, their physician's not the right physician to maybe be giving them advice yeah. about this topic uh, to feel like they can have this outlet, you know, to find, you know, what you're putting out there and knowing like, like, you know, here's tips, here's some advice, here's some understanding, here's all of these things, these tools to make, you know, life just a little bit easier for that individual caregiver, you know? And, and, exactly. And, yeah, I literally had one caregiver that was like, oh my gosh, I was in bed. I was, it was nighttime. I was at my wits end. You know, my husband was having a lot of trouble. I just didn't know what to do. And one day, like in bed in the middle of the night, I just like go onto YouTube and like you were there and I watched your videos. And she was like, oh my gosh, somebody's actually <laughs> telling us about right. this. Like, she was like, I wanted to tell everybody I knew. I couldn't believe it right. was there. And I, yeah. I totally understand the limitations and the hardships of the, the like the clinic providers. You know, like there's a neurology clinic in town who like di does a lot of dementia diagnoses and testing. And I, like, they give out my information because it's like, I understand you don't have the time. You, I couldn't have the time if I had five hours in a day, I still couldn't give all the information. Right. So it's like little bite-sized pieces they can get on their schedule, on their time without having to leave their home, I think is, it's a new Amazing. way of delivering care or delivering information. And, and I think it's and, really great. And I think, and I think the two is we're also talking about a, um, a population of people who now like the population that we're, like you're serving and you're like, you know, helping is like, you know, that's the same population that they, 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 they um, go online to research stuff. Like that's the generation that grew up, like, you know, researching about the car they were going to purchase or researching about this thing that they were going to buy uh, before they purchased it. And like, you know, I feel like now, like, you know, everyone, you know, kind of, is in some way or another is always like kind of like self analyzing any sort of medical concern or, you know, this or that, or, you know, not, but like they're doing that same thing when it comes to like, how do I take care of my loved one? Uh, and I'm dealing with these situations, like, how do I do this? And, you know, for you to be that resource is just so amazing. And, and, and I, I, what I love about it is like how freeing for you is it now like to be able to focus on this full time? Like, I know. Oh my gosh. I, like I have a million <laughs> ideas and uh, you know, I could just see the scale happening now and the bigger impact. It's like, I can't even know how I kept another job going <laughs> while <laughs> I was doing this. But now I have a team. So like that's helped. And things yeah, like that. What, what, in your mind, what, what do you what do you foresee is like the future of dementia care blazers? You know, do you have an idea of what that looks like, uh, what you would like to you know see dementia care blazers become? Yeah, I would love so I would love for there to be a care blazer certification and to cert certify facilities kind of like magnet for hospitals like in nursing it's like how do you really distinguish a dementia center of excellence a lot of 
facilities, like maybe they get like an orientation training, maybe like they say every now and then they do training, but do they actually like have the knowledge, have the training? Are they committed to dementia excellence? I think a lot of people in dementia care, they might be thinking of dollar signs, which is fine if you want to run a business, but do you want to run a business that is heartfelt, that has a great reputation and actually knows what they're doing? So I see myself having a CareBlazer certification for facilities. Um, I also see myself having an entire product line for dementia friendly, um, product products, gadgets, useful things for caregivers, and then definitely continuing exactly what I'm doing right now, just at larger scale. Yeah. I love it. I, I can't wait to see like you, uh, at a million subs and just, you know, hundreds of millions of views and the, the impact that that's going to have on, on this world. I mean, it's, it's truly amazing, you know? And that's it. It's I about just, the impact. Like the numbers are cool. Like I never thought I'm like, Oh my gosh, somebody's watching me talk about this nerdy thing, but no, it's like, it's really the impact. And I have to remind myself of that over and over whenever I'm like scared to do a video or I think it's right. silly. It's like, no, somebody's looking for this answer right now. Yeah. And, and I think that when I, and I, when I use the numbers, I think it's just, to me, it's validating just the power, like of how much of an impact you're really having. You know, it's not like, 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 it's, and, I, and I think, you know, in the world of like maybe finance or other, or real estate, you know, those types of numbers are like kind of so commonplace, but like in this particular space, I feel like it's so not common that the fact that you've achieved that just goes to show like how much of an impact you're having. So I think, yeah. you know, um, I, I'm only using those numbers to just really truly validate the need that exists out there that sometimes I feel like goes just, just goes untouched or um, just untalked about, you know? Totally. And, and, I totally and agree. So I, I, I mean, I'm so excited. I can't wait to uh, learn more about the Care Blazers certification too. And, you know, as I was thinking about that, you know, one of the things um, kind of as, you know, someone in the care space, like one, one of the things I feel like is so important, I don't know if you've thought about this, but when you mentioned the certification, I was like, would it ever make sense for you to have like, um, you know, care, care Blazer ambassadors in local markets that can really provide that hands-on training? Because I feel like yeah. even with all the um, video stuff out there, like, like, especially for your team, you know, um, especially for a team that maybe has never gone through it and they've only kind of been in a professional caregiving setting to be able to like have an advocate that like yes. has all those tools, those resources that can come into each location and be oh, that sure. true extension of you, you know? Absolutely. That would be a yeah. future goal for sure. Okay. Well, that's awesome. I, I cannot wait to see like all this come together and, and uh, you know, what I guess like, you know, as far as like your first step, as far as like the next step, like what do you, what do you foresee where you spending where do you see yourself spending your most time maybe over the next you know year or two so the next year or two, definitely scaling what I have. So I've always had a care course that people can join 24 seven access, and it gives them like all the tools and resources they need to, uh, feel better as a caregiver, feel prepared, know what they're, uh, know what to expect and how to deal with challenging situations. But, um, about three months ago, I added in a membership portion called my dementia care club. And so that's really been amazing. And it's, you know, I'm giving live Q and A's. I'm doing new monthly trainings right. every month. It's really building an amazing community. There's support rooms where the care blazers inside the club come together every single week and they share what's working for each other and offer a really nice area of support and understanding and help versus just like ones that it's really easy to just vent and complain. And some it's like, no, like right. they understand the care blazer model. They understand like the teachings, they have the basic foundation. Now they're into this dementia care club and they're helping each other through there. So Love Love I'd it. say next two years, it's just scaling that, helping more people know about it, uh, qualifying them to get into it, making sure it's a good fit for them. And then once that's like good and stable, it will move on to the certification. Oh man. So, so cool. Love that. Now, what, what percentage of people do you feel like, are you helping that are more family caregivers versus like professional caregivers? Right now, the people who join my program, I would bet 90% are family caregivers. Yep. And then out of those family caregivers, um, what percentage do you feel like are like, you know, adult children taking care of their mom or dad versus uh, maybe spouses taking care of a loved one? I say for the people who are coming to me, about 70% are caring for a spouse or a partner, and then about 30% are um, caring for a parent, grandparent, yeah. an aunt, a friend, something like that. Now, do you find, because I've seen some of your content too, do you find those two, uh, the way you support those caregivers being very di like being different as far as how you provide 
like tips and tricks or just kind of support to them? Um, uh, there are different aspects just in terms of the relationship, you know, that might be harder for a spouse and a partner and then might be harder as a parent. You know, there, there's definitely like a re- differences in the relationship there, but yeah. the premise and what I teach is the same and can be applied to any of those situations. And in my support rooms, I do have it separated for like, here's spouses and partners, here are um, non-spouses and partners. You can feel free to like go to the sure. other ones if you want, but just know the primary people in this group are going to be caring for this person. That way they can talk about, you know, maybe loss of sexual intimacy with their partner and talk about some of those problems, what, which the the parent and the child's not really having that, but then maybe they're having problems dealing with like, well, they did, they weren't really a great parent growing up to them. And now they're sacrificing so much to care right. for them now. How do you deal with that? So just like maybe the topics of conversation are a little bit geared differently. Yeah. And, and, and I think that that's so important too, like helping, cause I feel like, cause I feel like, yeah, the way you support each of those, um, those groups, you know, is a little bit different. And I, I've always felt like sometimes it seems like it's gotta be hard for that to like lose a spouse, someone you've loved your entire life. And then you're like living with this person, but it's like, now this person's not really your partner as much as like, you know, you're having to take care of them. And I feel like that's gotta be a really emotional, like a big emotional struggle, you know, where, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of underlying stuff on the adult children side, but maybe there's more of an expectation that at some point I might have to take care of my mom or dad because I, I see s- certain signs that are coming, you know? Yeah. Um, and but- for them, it's like, you know, they're in the prime of their life or maybe they're trying to raise their own kids or maybe their own marriage right. is struggling because they're putting so much time and attention on their parent with dementia. So yeah. definitely some yeah. different challenges, but at the root yeah. of it all, it's like, what are we going to do with it? How are we going to cope yeah. with it? How do you want to show up right now in your caregiving well- experience? What do you find like is to be like the number one struggle people face or is that even too hard to put just a number one? But like, um, you know, is there is there a common question that you feel like you get asked a lot that, um, you know, seems to kind of be a recurring? uh... I think a common theme, it might sound a little bit different for depending on the person, but a common theme is just dealing with the overwhelming, complicated wave of different emotions that come along the journey and how to cope with all of that. I think there's people out there who do a really great job talking about, well, here's the dementia tip and a trick and an approach. But if we're ignoring that the person doing it might be in grief, might be in sadness, might be in overwhelm, might be in fear, might be in worry, might be in anxiety. So it's how do we help them with that so that they can show up and apply these tips and approaches and strategies better. So a lot of uh, what I hear and see are, um, I'm just, I, I'm losing, I'm so frustrated. I'm so angry. I'm resentful. I'm heartbroken. I'm sad. I'm worried. It's like that, like the theme of the, the actual caregiver, how are they going to do this? How can they even follow all these tips when they're feeling this way? I think, uh, yeah. um, I see a lot of that. Yeah. Which I feel like, do you feel like that like kind of like, um, is part of like this guilty feeling of like, um, like, you know, I, I know I need to help, but then I like just, you know, it's kind of like this, like, you know, I feel like sometimes families, I feel like they're, they're like suffering from this guilt where they, when they come around others that are going through the same thing, it almost gives them relief. Like, okay, it's not just me, you know? Yeah. It, there's big power in understanding you're not alone. And I think it's, it's so crazy for, uh, for there's like millions and millions of caregivers out there in the world and th- many of them feel alone and they don't realize what they're going through is not something unusual or unique. It's something, it doesn't mean anything bad about them so many other people are going through it. So I think there's a lot of power in the numbers and guilt is a big one. And, you know, any feeling comes from your thinking. And if you're feeling guilty, it's because you have a thought like you shouldn't have done something or you should have done something differently or, you know, so it's a matter of like also teaching them, like, why are we even like, let's question that thought. Are you doing something that you shouldn't do? Like what makes you think that's wrong to who? So many of us were just like on this autopilot default. We're not even questioning like, you know, what would you say to another caregiver in this group who was telling you this and they felt guilty about it? Do you think they're an awful right. caregiver? No. And then why do you think you're an awful caregiver? Right. You know, so it's a lot yeah. of that kind of stuff for sure yeah. plays a big yeah. part. Well, I, I, all I know is like, I just think you're doing an amazing job and I am so incredibly like just proud of all the things that you've accomplished and just kind of actually seeing you originally or kind of stumbling across your information back in 2018, 2019, whenever we were planning our conference to like, to see what you've accomplished now. I was just like, wow, like this is amazing. And uh, I just think you have such a bright future ahead of you. And there's gonna be so many more millions of family caregivers that you're going to help. Um, and I just, I'm just so excited for everything that you're doing. It's amazing. Seriously. Awesome. It's uh, well, so thank cool. You. Yeah. Thank you for and, having uh, me in for all your kind words. Is there anything that in your mind that you would want to leave 
like anyone out there with um, and maybe kind of catering to like in this particular case, like the aspiring entrepreneur, yes. maybe in the senior yeah. care world that like yeah. is trying to find their place, you know? Totally. Go for it. Do it. Like your brain is going to try to talk you out of it in so many ways. And especially if you're in the caregiving world and you're trying to start a caregiving business, we need you more than ever. And the the caregiving world, and I feel like a lot of the hospital world and healthcare world, we're not taught this. We don't know, like we're not taught about business and we're not taught about um, doing things outside of the mold and outside of the norm, but it's so much worth the work to do and going through that discomfort because the impact you can make on people's lives is so much greater. Um, if you love working in the hospital and you love doing that, nothing wrong with it. It's been great for me. I actually worked 13 years in the VA, but if you have that itch and you have that calling, like start putting your information out there. I also think for anybody in this situation, like for me, I just thought what I knew was basic. I just thought like, Oh, well, like I don't have anything special to offer. I don't have anything like an, I don't know anything groundbreaking, but what I realize is that there are people out there who actually haven't been taught this or nobody's taken the time to share this with them. So I do have something to offer the, like the biggest thing was just getting over all of the fear and doubt and worry in my mind that I'm doing something that a healthcare provider should not do. And I think that you can make an amazing business and build an amazing life and build amazing wealth while still being super caring and actually helping other people. It's not like I had to do a lot of work about like, you're not taking advantage of anybody. You're not like doing anything wrong. You, how do you deliver value? The more you are helpful, the more value and help you can give, you're going to be set up. You're going to have a great, yeah. great business. So just really like, don't let that fear voice take over. Cause that was my biggest obstacle. And I think, you know, a lot of times too, for us in the healthcare space, because, you know, we tend to have a tendency to just be so kind of caring uh, by, by default. Yes. You know, that sometimes like it's like the the entrepreneurial nature is not as is, is yeah. not it's not like our home. It's not where we feel at home. We feel at home in the caring side of things. Yeah. Yeah. And we need that encouragement. And then and we need that kind of like, you know, that attitude of like, just go for it. You know, just yes. make it happen. Yeah. And what I will say, it's my the, biggest tip actually that I realized is perhaps not look to the other caregiving space for your business ideas and for um, your direction and what to do. I'm looking to the business space. I am looking to the businesses yeah. that are having great growth and who are doing great things. I'm like, what are they doing? How do I make this apply to caregiving? Could I use this Love to it. caregiving? Because if you're looking, yep. like if I'm looking to the hospital system or to the other yep. caregiving space, I wouldn't be where I'm at. Yeah, exactly. And that's so true. And because we, I do this all the time. We, um, you know, like a lot of the stuff that we're doing, you know, is modeled from other entrepreneurial conferences yes. and, and we're really doing it so that, like we're kind of modeling what they're doing, but we're applying it to the senior care world, yes. you know, and it's, and it's so uncommon, you know, but it's like, yeah. but it, yeah. it, like, you know, most of the conferences I go to are like that are business oriented are all, I mean, it's rare that I meet someone in that conference that's in senior care. And when I do, I'm like, Oh, <laughs> like we got to hang out. We got to connect. Yeah. You know, I I, I've met one person so far in the world right. that I'm in that's in the senior care. So. Right, right. Well, I'm, I'm so just impressed with everything you're doing. Uh, for those that um, want to just, you know, kind of see what uh, everything that Dr. Natalie has going on, make sure you go and check out Dementia Care Blazers on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and all that other good stuff. And uh, we'll, of course, make sure we post all her information uh, and how she can be contacted, you know, on uh, in, in the description and stuff as well. And Dr. Natalie, thank you so very much uh, for joining me today and for sharing your journey. Uh, I'm just so excited to see, you know, all that's to come. And uh, I know it's just the beginning, so. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Chris. <laughs> Talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Hey, guys. Thank you so much for making it this far. If you'd like to watch last week's episode, click here. If you'd like to watch more exciting content on senior care, click here. If you'd like to learn how to open up your own adult daycare, assisted living, or home care agency, click here. ChrisChana.com. This is for all those senior care entrepreneurs out there. And let's get back to work.